We're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Levine. Um, I think we may have hit a record for me. I've been doing webinars for about uh, 12 years now. Um, as of this morning, we had right around 1,500 people registered for the webinar. A uh, significant number of people are here already. I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes. I want to make sure that Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he needs. One of the challenges with this many people is that we do leave time at the end for question and answer period, usually about 10, 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Um, when we have this many people on, we're not going to get to every question. You know, I'm the only one that can see the questions. I do my best to consolidate some of them and merge some of them and try to hit as many bases as we can. I do apologize uh, if your specific question was not answered uh, because as I said, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, all of you on your screen should have, uh, you should see a little box there. It's, it's your go to webinar control panel. You can just go ahead and type in your questions as you think about them. I don't normally get to the questions until uh, Dr. Kaczynski is done speaking. So, uh, you know, as you think about them, type them in and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, within the next day or two, you should get an email with a link to the recording of the webinar. Uh, we record all the webinars, so don't worry if you can't stay towards the end. Uh, during the webinar, Dr. Kaczynski is going to be demonstrating a number of products that he uses, such as uh, the physics forceps and bone grafts. Uh, a number of these are exclusive to Golden Dent. Um, I wanted to thank Golden Dent for their sponsorship of this webinar. We've been doing webinars with Golden Dent for years. If you're in dentistry, then you know who they are and their commitment to, to ongoing dental education. Uh, we're very lucky to have Kurt Lawler from Golden Dent. He's going to come out at the very end and just for a couple of minutes uh, go over some of the great special pricing that they have and some of the educational opportunities. Um, also, as, as part of this, as part of their sponsorship, they will be providing a CE certificates. When we have 1,500 people registered, it takes a while to get them all out. So please be patient. I, we always get questions afterwards. When am I going to get my CE? Um, it can take a few weeks, uh, but they will go out as long as you're on the webinar. Uh, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce our, our special guest tonight. That's Dr. Timothy Kaczynski. He's an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He serves on the editorial review board of Reality and the Michigan Dental Association and serves as the associate editor of the National AGD. He's past president of the Michigan, Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He got his DDS from University of Detroit Mercy Dental School. He got a mastership in biochem from Wayne State University. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry, the ICOI, the American Society of Osteointegration. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He got his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. He has received way too many honors to, to enumerate, uh, including fellowship in the American and International College of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. He's placed I think uh, close to 15,000 dental implants and uh, published over close to 200 articles on surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry. He's been a contributor to several textbooks. He lectures throughout the U.S. each year, so you know, make sure you look out for him for you know, any upcoming events you may be attending. And he's a great guy. So without further ado, Tim, we're thrilled to have you on and looking forward to tonight's presentation. Well, thanks, Lauren. Um, it's always a pleasure to um to be on a, on a webinar with you. And, and I think we always show some, some really inter interesting practical things, um, Lauren, and I thank you for that, for that introduction. Um, you know, normally we, we've done a lot of programs in the past on, on different topics. We've done laser, we've done atraumatic extraction and grafting procedures. And um, when I was asked to do something, uh, a kind of a different topic, uh, on suturing techniques, there, there's a lot of interest in, in suturing and, and our title as, you, as you're aware, predictable suturing techniques for the general practitioner following extraction and graft to promote optimal healing. And um, Lauren, as, as you're aware, um, I, I am involved in a lot of, of teaching programs, implant teaching programs, the, uh, through Glidewell uh, Dental Lab and through the Engel Institute in, in Charlotte. And um, we do a lot of live patient uh, courses where doctors will come into the office and actually Treat, treat patients in our practice. And one of the things that I noticed uh, as, as we teach or we, we try to share our knowledge on, 
on extraction techniques or grafting or implants or whatever is is one of the one of the topics that really is missed is is suturing and suturing is such an important part of of what we do um, in in our practice to try to maximize um, the final prosthetic result and that's what's most important to me the 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 end result is what's critical in in trying to create emergence profile and form and function. Um, a lot of that has to do with going back to the basic procedures as far as suturing techniques. So hopefully we're going to have a little bit of fun for the next hour and hour, hour and 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for, for questions. Um, and so we, we came up with a list of objectives tonight. Um, we're going to talk a, a lot about the predictable suturing techniques um, that will, will uh, help you develop predictable healing. Um, and, and again, suturing is very, very important. We're going to talk a little bit of the flap design uh, that I create, reflection of tissue, uh, something I like to call an envelope flap. Uh, if, you, if you can imagine number 10 envelope, Lauren, where um, you blow into it, where we can control the soft tissue, which allows suturing to be much more effective um, and easy to do and also eliminate um, cutting or, or incising into mucosal tissue. Uh, and I've said this before, once we cut into mucosal tissue, we get a lot of histamine and prostaglandin release and the patients are uncomfortable. So most of our surgical procedures, all the surgical procedures that you're gonna see tonight um, have very little post-operative discomfort. As a matter of fact, it's rare to give anything more than uh, 600 milligrams of ibuprofen uh, following the procedures. We'll talk briefly about the different types of sutures and, and needles that are available, and uh, we'll talk about resorbable and, and non-resorbable suturing um, uh, products. Um, we'll talk about different kind of knots that we can we can create and how we can make the patient feel comfortable. Um, and we're, we're doing something fun today. Something that I haven't done before is uh, we're going to uh, to demonstrate the actual surgical techniques uh, on an orange. And I know. Um, um, Kurt at Golden Dent uh, sent out a, a, a e-blast that if you have an orange there and, and you have some suture and a needle, you can kind of follow along. And uh, if you don't, if, you, uh, if you'd like me to share this information with you, I'm sure that can be uh, provided through, through you, Lauren, or through uh, Kurt at Golden Dent. Um, but to get to that point, we're going to have to talk about uh, extractions and grafting and, and, and why we're doing certain, certain procedures. And many of you have, who have seen my webinars before have seen this slide. You know, I'm, I'm a general dentist in the suburbs of Detroit, and these are really my patients, the type of patients that present to my office on a regular basis. And you know, how do we treat them, and how, how do we, do we um, provide them form and function? Question I always ask is, how do people get to this point? And, and we know there's a number of reasons, um, uh, finances, uh, insurance, fear of the dentist. So being able to provide a positive service for our patients, I think, is, is absolutely the best marketing strategy uh, that you can provide. And so to do that, um, you have to learn how to extract. You need to know how to graft. And if you're extracting and grafting, you need to know how to suture. And then also with our implant placements. Again, Lauren, this is not necessarily a, a formal extraction type of webinar, nor a, a specific grafting webinar, nor a specific implant webinar. Uh, and, and we've done plenty of those in the past, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll do some more in the future. So um, what we really want to focus on is how we handle soft tissue uh, in our surgical procedures in my practice, and how we can get the results that, that we want to achieve. So again, uh, the term that I like to use um, for my extractions is atraumatic extractions. I've been criticized in the past for using that term, uh, but uh, we can call it minim minimally invasive extractions. But atraumatic extraction is, is an important term for me in that we're trying to maintain the hard tissue, maintain the bone. So whenever we can maintain the facial plate of bone, the mesial and distal interceptal bone, it allows us to achieve better periodontal uh, control and also allows us to, to create better um, interdental papilla. So maintaining hard tissue is critical to the results that, that I have received uh, in my practice. Lots of ways to extract teeth. We all have our, our favorites. We're all trained a certain way. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm proud to say that I, I brought a, a, a new doctor into the practice. Um, after many years, um, 
Um, Dr. Bauer, if you're out there, I'm saying, I'm giving you a shout out. I'm very proud and honored to have her join the practice. And, um, and uh, she has her techniques and, and we're slowly developing uh, uh, more efficient and uh, proficient ways of, of uh, treating our patients, treating her patients in our practice. So what I wanna leave you with today are things that I do in my practice. I know there's a lot of ways of doing the same thing. I'm gonna show you the materials that I use, the products that I use, um, and if you want to achieve the same successes that I, I achieve, all I can really do is just share uh, the knowledge that I have that have made me very predictable um, in my practice. So hopefully you'll, you'll respect that. One of my favorite instruments um, is the Golden Dent Physics Forceps. Many of you are, are very familiar with the Physics Forceps. They are instruments that I would not practice without in my, when, in, every day in my practice. I just wouldn't practice without them. Um, anything that will save my body, my hands, my arm, my shoulders um, are important tools. And uh, for those of you who have seen the program before, you know that this instrument consists of two components, a beak, which is like a shovel-shaped edge, and a bumper, which is really the, uh, a, a fulcrum or a center of rotation. It really isn't the working end of the instrument at all, but rather allows the, the instrument to uh, create energy on the palatal or lingual aspect of a root, and that energy will result in a physiologic reaction which will break down the periodontal ligament. What's holding our teeth in place is the periodontal ligament, and if we can uh, destroy the periodontal ligament using this special instrument, uh, the tooth will lift up and out of the socket without a lot of force, no, no squeezing of the instrument, no forearm, no bicep, no shoulder pressure whatsoever. So it is one of my favorite instruments, that's a whole nother, a non, whole nother webinar uh, that we can, we can talk about in the future. But again, um, the instrument is very specific. We would place in this situation a non-restorable tooth. We would place the beak on the palatal aspect, one to three millimeters subgingival. I would place the bumper, which is simply a, a center of rotation as high up the vestibule as possible. And I would not squeeze the handles, but I would simply rotate my wrist towards the corner of the eye here, the left eye in this situation. And in a matter of seconds, a matter of minute, that tooth will luxate up and out of the socket and allow me to remove it. And you can see, I don't need to squeeze the instrument at all. Rather, I'm creating tension on the palatal aspect in this situation, which again is creating that physiologic uh, reaction. So just to run through a very, very quick, quick case before we go into specifics on suturing, we have a tooth that's deemed non-restorable that we want to remove. And um, a molar tooth, I'll, I'm going to leave you with a question. How would you normally remove this tooth? I, I would assume that, that many of us uh, in the audience listening would um, simply uh, section this root from mesial to distal uh, and then section the, the facial roots um, from the center groove to the facial aspect and, and use some kind of a luxator or separator and try to remove those teeth in, um, in three separate pieces. Uh, that's rarely what I do in my practice. I would take the one instrument, the physics forcep for the, for the um, ma uh, maxillary posterior molar area. I would engage the palatal aspect of the root and I would simply rotate my wrist and the tooth would, would come out. Um, we have some nice instruments um, also. Uh, periotomes are very effective if you're concerned about uh, the facial plate of bone being relatively thin. So you can use our, a periotome to, to go between the tooth and the, the hard tissue structure to kind of separate that to some degree before you use the final instrument. And this is a very, very nice tool from Golden Dent, um, uh, a set of periotomes that that again, uh, something that I use routinely in my, my practice. And here I'm using it uh, palatally, again, just to, um, to uh, go between the root structure and uh, kind of separate the, the hard tissue from the root structure. And simply taking my one instrument, you can see this is an upper left physics forcep engaging the palatal root, one to three millimeters subgingival, placing that bumper high up the vestibule, and just rotating my wrist towards the corner of the left eye. And without squeezing the handle, simply rotating them. Actually, if you can look at the bottom of the screen, my one finger, just a portion of that one finger, is creating tension uh, on that palatal aspect of that root. 
and in a matter of minutes, this tooth will luxate up and out of the socket. The instrument's not intended to remove the tooth in total, rather it's intended to um, elevate the tooth up and out of the socket, and then I would take simply take what we call a tooth delivery instrument and remove the tooth in total. Uh, the facial plate is intact. You can see the div divergence of these, this three-rooted tooth, um, and it's an extraction that is relatively atraumatic to the patient because you're not squeezing. The patient really doesn't experience a lot of uh, head movement or, or uh, stimulation. As a matter of fact, oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll take a tooth out and the patient will look at me and then they'll say, you're, you're kidding, the tooth is out. Um, they are amazed. Now that's marketing for you. Um, but we will remove the tooth so it's atraumatic to the patient. It's atraumatic to the hard tissue. Bone is gold to me, uh, especially in the posterior uh, maxillary area. We have the sinus floor. We know that that tooth root is acting like a uh, tent pole holding up a circus tent. And if you remove the circus, uh, the tent pole, the circus tent is going to collapse. One of the reasons why many of us do not place dental implants in the posterior maxilla is because we don't have adequate bone. So it's imperative that we atraumatically remove the tooth, atraumatic to the patient, atraumatic to the hard tissue. And maybe as important as those two, atraumatic to me, um, taking a very challenging situation in some, some, uh, some uh, respect to a fairly simple routine procedure uh, in my practice and a very financial rewarding uh, technique in our practice. So you can see the divergence of, of those roots and we're able to remove the tooth quite effectively um, in our practice. So we take a radiograph and uh, the next step is obviously to curette any granulation in that socket. And I want you to look at the soft tissue here. We've maintained the interceptal bone, which hopefully will help us maintain interdental papilla in the final restoration, whatever that will be. We have certainly have a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of this tooth also, which is imperative for uh, successful dental implant restorations. But I will curette aggressively, uh, making sure there's no ex excessive granulation, uh, eliminate any purple blood. Red blood is good, um, and we have a site. You can see as curetting, we're, we're simply removing a big snot of granulation tissue, which is infected tissue. It's important that we, we handle this situation uh, delicately. Now, again, this is not a grafting webinar, but here we used a, um, a grafting material to fill the three sockets. Now, um, this happens to be uh, what we call an osteogen plug, uh, and you can talk to our contact Golden Dent about that product, but it is a calcium appetite material. It's a synthetic material or an alloplastic material that I've had tremendous success with uh, over the years. I've done a lot of histologic evaluation, and I can honestly tell you that we will form bone in preparation for a dental implant in a very short amount of time, anywhere from three to five months, depending on the size of the socket. Um, I don't use a membrane with this particular material because of the, um, the uh, matrix that it forms in does not allow invagination of epithelium. However, I do want that, that graft material to stay in place, so I will suture. Now I can slow down a little bit, Lauren, and, and kind of explain suturing. So my suturing technique is very specific, um, and, I, and I wanna go a little bit slow here, and then we can speed up a little bit later. One of the biggest problems that I see um, practitioners in my courses as they're suturing is we have a tendency to go from the facial to the palatal or facial to the lingual. And that, that creates a real big problem, especially if you have a membrane in position. If you go from facial to palatal in this case, oftentimes we, you will engage the membrane or the graft material. And you can suture it tight, but unfortunately um, on suture removal, if you are gonna remove the sutures in a period of time, you will oftentimes remove the membrane or the graft material or the staph will. And this creates a real problem. We must protect that, that graft material and membrane uh, for at least a six week period. So suturing of the graft or the membrane is imperative. And so if you use a reverse cutting needle, and we're gonna discuss that in just a few moments, the design of our, of our dental uh, surgical needles, um, it, is, it is only cutting um, uh, on one side. And I have uh, taken the, the needle and I am penetrating from the 
crestal aspect from the central groove area to the facial. What this means is I'm riding on top of the graft material, or on top of the membrane. I'm not going to engage the graft. I'm gonna turn the needle around, and I'm doing the same thing on the pal palatal in this situation. I'm going from the crestal aspect, and I'm engaging the pal palatal soft tissue or attached gingiva uh, from the crest to the, to the uh, palate area, riding over the top of the graft material in the situation or any membrane. This is, can't be any simpler than this. We're just doing two interrupted sutures in an X form. And this is plenty to hold that graft material or hold that membrane into position. We're gonna talk specifically about the different types of, of suturing in just a few moments. Epithelium will grow about a half a millimeter a day. So let's say we have um, 10 millimeters of, of exposed area there. So theoretically in, in about 20 days, that will cover over completely. Assuming that the epithelium is growing about a half a millimeter a day. Epithelium will ride on top of this. It will not invaginate into the graft material. I will bring this patient back in a week. I'd like to see my surgical patients back in a week, at most 10 days, to remove the sutures. And the reason I do that is, um, oftentimes the sutures will, will be a little bit irritative, irritative to the patient, meaning we'll do the surgery, they're doing really well. Patients do extremely well. They take Advil. Um, they will do very well for three or four days. If you don't tell them ahead of time, they will call and they may call and they'll say, you know what, I was tell doctor I was doing really well, but you know what, it's been four days, five days, and it's something's wrong, something's bothering me. And it's because the tissue wants to heal, they, it wants to, to, to cover over or, or close, and the sutures won't let it. So be aware of that. I like to see my surgical patients. Uh, we're being paid well for this procedure, and I like to see the patients, see how they're healing, seeing how they're, they're maintaining the area. One of, the, one of the best suture books that I have come across is, uh, is this one here, it's called The Suture Book. And you can currently purchase it through Salvin Dental, S-A-L-V-V-I-N, salvindental.com. Uh, um, it maybe is $100, $110 book, but it's a, a schematic of the different suturing techniques that you can use in your practice. So if you have a chance uh, to get online, and Kurt, you may want to, to, um, to actually uh, see if you can get a hold of these books and, and provide it to your, your doctors, I think that would be a big, big help. But it is a definite uh, necessity for um, learning how to properly suture um, and close reflective tissue or flaps. So uh, take a photo of this, and I think it's something that you should look at. Uh, Salvin Dental, I know, has them. Um, and uh, you can get it, get it online and you'll have it in a few days. So specifically in, in my practice, um, let's just, again, slow down a little bit. There's different types of suture materials. I like to use a resorbable material and I will use a polyglycolic acid, synthetic absorbable braided uh, material. Vicryl is the brand name. Um, you can purchase this through many sources and it will resorb normally completely in about 28 days. The reason I like this material so much is that it does not attract bacteria so much, um, and it's braided, and the, the end result, as it resorbs, it resorbs to water. So to me, it is the kindest um, uh, suture material that I use routinely in my practice. Unfortunately, it's also a little expensive uh, for us, but again, um, to have the patients have a positive response, a positive surgical response, it's worth it. Silk has been a standard material for a long time. I don't use a lot of silk in my practice. Uh, I don't find it um, uh, necessarily useful. Uh, it does attract bacteria. Uh, it does have to be removed uh, after a short period of time. It will not resorb. And if it's not resorbed properly, it can cause some, some irritation. One of the more popular um, uh, resorbable materials that is, is, is used it, because it's relatively expensive are the gut materials, the plain gut or the chromic gut. I do have this in my practice. Um, however, I find the manipulation of the material uh, rather challenging. 
Um, you have to really understand uh, how to tie a knot, which we'll talk about in a few moments again. Um, so the, the polyglycolic acid synthetic material is like a combination between the resorbable gut materials and the, the uh, easy to tie non-resorbable silk materials. So use what you feel most comfortable with. Um, but again, I'm showing you what, what I use, what I feel is works best in my hands. Our needles today are uh, reverse cutting uh, needles. And this allows us to tie knots um, or go through the tissue without ripping or tearing the tissue as we're tying our knot. Um, so you can see the anatomy of the needle. We have a point, we have the body, uh, and we have a part that has the widest diameter. And in this, this schematic where it says wide diameter, that is where you wanna hold the needle holder, okay? If you hold it too close to the, to the thread uh, or to the, the um, suture material, um, material itself, oftentimes you, you can damage that needle and uh, it will break. So hold it into the widest portion of that, that needle where it says uh, wire diameter is, is the largest. The, the design, I will use a 3 8 circle or a half, half circle, uh, depending on the situation. Probably my go-to uh, suture needle is the 3 8, su suture, uh, three eight circ circle. And obviously there's different uh, sizes or thicknesses of uh, thread materials. I, could, I normally will use a, a 3-0 or a 4-0 um, material. So it's important that you understand the needle anatomy, uh, what we're using in our practice, and feel comfortable. What I'd like to do now is uh, we, we created a short video, um, uh, about 20 minutes long, on different suturing designs on an orange. So those of you who want to follow along, if you have an orange, please, please feel free. Um, for those of you who don't, um, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you to get that suture book and or contact Golden Dent and get a copy of what we did so that you can practice. Like everything, practice makes perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and play this video for, for a short time, and then we will finish up with some, some really nice clinical cases, and I think you'll have a, a pretty decent understanding of the, um, of the uh, techniques that I use in my practice. So let's practice our suturing techniques on an orange. An orange is a great fruit to, uh, to practice our suturing techniques. And we talked about the, the book that I'd like you to get. You can get it on Google called Principles of Dental Suturing from Lee Silverstein. Silverstein, um, it's a great uh, schematic book of different suturing techniques. We're not gonna go through every suturing technique available to you, but I'm gonna use, show you the ones that I use most frequently. Um, before we begin, let's just look at our sutures. And in dentistry, we will use a 3 8 circle. This is what I use most often. We can use a 1 half circle or a 5 8 circle. All the needles that we're using uh, in dentistry that I use are reverse cutting, which means that we're not gonna be tearing the tissue as we're suturing our attached gingiva. There are different types of suture, uh, suture uh, techniques. Uh, these include an interrupted, which we will discuss. We'll talk about a modified interrupted. We'll do a continuous. Uh, maybe we'll even do a continuous locking. Uh, we can do a continuous horizontal mattress, a vertical mattress, and a horizontal mattress. And I think if we go through those seven techniques, um, we've demonstrated uh, just about every application that you will um, uh, use in your practice. So here today, we're going to use our uh, 3 8 circle reverse cutting needle with a 3-0 plain gut. And remember we talked about earlier the sizes of, um, of the thread uh, goes from 1-0 to 10-0, with 10-0 being the smallest. So in dentistry, most of the time, I will use either a 3-0 or a 4-0 uh, suture. There are different types of suture material that we, we can discuss. First is silk. Silk is the most common. It's very, relatively inexpensive, and it ties a very, very nice knot. But remember that silk draws bacteria um, and needs to be removed in a short period of time because we will get some inflammation. Some of the um, polyester materials like uh, PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, 
are are braided and they are lubricated to some uh, to some extent. And these are non-resorbable. Um, I guess uh, we used to talk about Gore-Tex materials. Um, they they slide and they can't untie um, uh, sometimes. So it's a material that I don't use that much. Resorbable material, we're gonna be using a resorbable here. Um, really there's two basic categories, the plain gut, which unfortunately loses its strength after about 24 hours. And then chromic gut, which is treated with a chromium salt, will last up to 10 days. And I mentioned in my lectures that I like to bring my patients back routinely, even if they have resorbable sutures, in seven to 10 days uh, to eliminate any inflammation, uh, irritation, and just to check on the surgical site. What I use most often, and what you've seen in my lectures, are the synthetic materials, the PGA, polyglycolic acid materials. Uh, this is like Vicrol or Villet. Uh, these are hydrophobic. Uh, there's a slower rate of resorption uh, from three weeks to four weeks. We get very, very mild tissue reaction and they resist muscle pull. They also are very easy to use. They're a little more expensive than say the synthetic materials than the uh, polyester materials um, or the resorbable uh, plain gut or chromic gut, but that's what I use most oftenly, often in my practice. So let's discuss different types of uh, sutures. And what we'll do is you'll take your scalpel, and here I'm just using a dis disposable scalpel, and let's just take our work, be very careful with the sharp blade, and we will simply make a long incision here. Now, when you're, when you're making an incision in tissue, we want to make sure that we have a clean incision and try to make one pass. So you're going to go all the way to bone through the periosteum, and that allows us to, to make a clean incision um, without um, having to make multiple pass-throughs or multiple cuts. I mentioned in my lecture, we like to stay in attached gingiva, even if we're doing vertical incisions, try not to go into the mucosal tissue. When we go into the mucosal tissue, uh, we will uh, create a lot of prostaglandin release and the patients are very sore. Also, we lose control. Uh, we lose control of our, um, of our uh, relieved or our flap material. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to, to suture them close. So we made an incision. And let's go ahead and let's let's practice on some of our techniques. So let's just do a simple suture. Now uh, we have different um, different types of uh, suture holders. We can use a hemostat, which is in your kit, or just something fancier. Um, but let's just do a simple interrupted to begin. In a simple interrupted, we call this the the facial or buccal, and this is the lingual. We go from facial through the tissue onto the lingual or palatal, can't be any simpler than that. We'll leave a little bit of a tail. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to loop, loop twice, one, two, grab onto the end of the tail, and pull taut, and then do the same thing, one, two, taut, and then once backwards, just one, grab the tail, and lock it in. And then we can take our scissors and simply cut. So we have an interrupted suture. Pretty basic, pretty simple, works very, very well. The second one we'd like to do is called a modified interrupted, where we'll go from facial through the incision site, not onto the lingual or palatal. Leave a little tail. And then simply reverse your needle, and then go from the lingual or palatal through the incision line, not onto the facial. And this will kind of pull the incision together. And the same technique, two, two, one, will give you a nice closure. 
This is referred to as a modified interrupted suture. And it's good to practice um, these, these techniques. They work very, very well. And then you can cut that. So that's called a modified interrupted. When we have a long incision, uh, a continuous suture is often very, very helpful. So here we will do a, our same passage as if we were doing an interrupted. And we'll tie the knot as we did earlier. Two, two, one. And we'll simply cut the tail here. Leave the long part alone. And then we're simply kind of going back and forth here from facial to lingual or palatal. And then just keep passing it through as if you were sewing. I'm sure a lot of us still darn sucks today. And this will give you is a very, very simple suture to get closure. And if we want to tie the knot to finish the, the line, this will be that a little bit taller and simply same technique two, two, one. of that suture. I don't use this, um, this type of continuous very often, but it will work very well and fits very quick. Let's move on to a continuous that I use more often, which is a continuous locking. Now let's make, go ahead and make another incision here. And this time I'm going to use an Orban knife. I'm not sure you have an Orban knife in your kit, but you saw me demonstrate it during the lecture. And instead of a scalpel blade, an Orban knife is is very specially angled, uh, very sharp blades. I, I love this instrument. It allows me to make a very nice controlled incision. And even if we were working around teeth, we can make a nice incision. You heard me in the lecture talk about an envelope flap where we have like a number 10 envelope and we open it uh, by blowing into it. So again, we can make a nice incision here. So let's do a continuous locking suture. One of my favorites when I have a very long uh, span of, of reflection. So let's just look at the suture for a moment. As you take these, um, these gut sutures out of the package, they're kind of curly. So if you just hold on to it and kind of run your finger through it, you'll straighten it out. So let's do a continuous locking suture. So again, I'm starting with and interrupt it as we've done previously. And again, two forward, two forward, one back is my technique and sutures just don't come loose when you follow that technique. So two, two, and one backwards. And then we'll simply cut the tail. Leave it two or three millimeters so that your staff is easy to, to see. Now, what we're going to do here is kind of interesting. I'll go kind of slow here. Is we're going to go facial to lingual or palatal again, as we've done earlier. We're going to space these a uh, millimeter um, or two millimeters apart. Okay, now this is important. So we have the circle here, and we're going to go through the circle and pull it taut. So 
And then we can continue that pattern. This is a nice suture when I have a uh, long span. Can okay, pull it through. Again, you have your circle. Bring it through. And I'll usually have a staff member kind of hold it for me taut so that the sutures stay taut. And let's just do one more. So suturing is very, very important. Now when you're finished, this becomes your tail. The circle becomes your tail. And again, two forward. Two forward, two forward again. And one backwards. Very consistent. Get into the routine and these knots will not come loose for you. And then we can simply cut both of them really effectively. So that's called a continuous locking suture. Works very, very well. See the loops. Now it nice it closes that area. Saves a lot of time also. Another uh, popular suture, one that I don't use that often, is called a, um, a horizontal mattress continuous suture. So I made another incision there. And what we simply do here, same as before, do it interrupted. And two forward, two forward, and one in reverse, and simply cut the tail. As we will come through again from the facial. From the facial to the lingual or palatal. And then instead of going back towards the facial, come back to the lingual and then go towards the facial. It's just another way of closing a long incision line. And again, here we're going from facial to lingual again. And you can continue that. You can see that close up view of that. Uh, this is now a horizontal mattress area. If you can see here, what we're able to accomplish there. And then you tie that off as we normally did. Two more sutures that I'd like to demonstrate. One is called the uh, vertical mattress. And again, what we'll simply do is go from, from, let's go from facial to lingual. Let's be consistent here. We'll go from facial to lingual. Leave the little tail there. And then we'll come back around and go from lingual to facial, not exactly in the same hole. And this is called a vertical mattress. And this will tie your, your sutures very nice. Um, also, it's really nice suture around implants or, or healing abutments. Um, seem to work very, very well. You can see how nice closure you'll get there. And again, same technique, two forward, two forward, one back. And you'll get an excellent closure and a nice result. I'm going to demonstrate a horizontal mattress suture. And oftentimes, if we had an implant here in an abutment, then what we'll simply do is go from facial to lingual. Leave a short tail. Then come around and go from lingual to facial. And 
and that's called a horizontal mattress. And again, we'll tie that off as we normally would two to one. I want to show you as a little bonus here is um, um, I showed you in the lecture how oftentimes when I do an atraumatic extraction and we graft, we place the membrane, I'll just place two cross-linked um, interrupted sutures, one from mes mesial facial to distal lingual, and then one from distal facial to mesial lingual. And those two sutures will simply, call, um, simply result in an X that will hold the membrane in place. But to save time, oftentimes what I'll do is I do a, um, a, a cross-linked uh, mattress suture where I'll go from mesial facial to distal facial and then come across to the lingual and go from mesial lingual to distal lingual. And you can see there's your first part of your, your cross. And then simply tie it off again to two and then one backwards. And you can see how you have your X and that will hold your membrane in place very effectively. So that's just a, a one stage cross link mattress suture that will hold things in place. So I, hopefully that was helpful. Um, it, I know we have to run through it quickly because we only have an hour or so together. Um, but again, I think the techniques that we're demonstrating can be easily taught um, by just practicing. Um, so what I'd like to do now for the next um, 15 minutes or so is to go through some clinical cases of how, how suturing is so important to get the end result we want. Um, here we have a, a situation where we have two non-restorable teeth uh, that are going to require extractions. Um, and what we will do is graft and immediately place implants in those areas. And again, I love the physics forcep, and we will use my atraumatic extraction protocol where I'm engaging the, the palatal uh, aspect of the root, one to three millimeter subgingival uh, with the beak, place the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, and without any force whatsoever, you're not squeezing the handles. This is not truly a forcep, it's more of a luxator. And I will uh, simply rotate my wrist towards the uh, corner of the eye and the tooth in a matter of seconds to, to minutes will elevate up and out of the socket. Remember the instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total, rather it's intended to luxate the tooth up and out. We will then take a tooth delivery instrument and remove the roots in total. And here we're extracting the two teeth. Now this is where it gets very, very important. We have to look at what we have remaining here. Um, you can you could tell by the extraction of the tooth that the uh, we did not damage the facial plate of, of, of bone with the extraction. We're looking at the band of attached gingiva in this area. Uh, the next step always, always, always in this situation is to take a sharp curette and um, uh, make sure there's no roots uh, remaining, no root fractures. So take a radiograph and I will curette the site. I will then make a reflection. And I mentioned this to you in the very beginning. Um, I really like to teach uh, envelope reflections or envelope flaps, meaning I try not to make vertical incisions and I try not to make vertical incisions, especially in the mucosal tissue. Once you incise into the mucosal tissue, you will lose control of that flap and you will create a lot of post-operative discomfort, bruising, swelling, pain. Uh, patients are not happy. So I try to not uh, incise into mucosal tissue whenever possible. So here I'm taking that Orban knife, which is a, a very nice instrument. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, I advise that you, you contact Golden Dent. They have a, a wonderful grafting kit um, that, that we helped create. 
um, that I think would, would keep all your instruments in, in one place uh, and make you very proficient and efficient. I'm elevating the facial tissue and you can see there's no vertical incisions. I'm elevating like an envelope and I'm exposing the facial plate of bone, but I'm also, if you can see, exposing the facial defect. I did not create that defect by my extraction. The fracture in those roots over a period of time created that defect. Now in, in there, our grafting courses that, that we teach and the, the courses that Golden Den teaches, uh, we can certainly teach you how to effectively grow facial plate of bone predictably. Uh, it is a protocol, a technique. Again, this isn't necessarily a grafting course, but I do want to demonstrate the importance of it. You have to feel comfortable reflecting tissue, both facially and palatally, um, and being in control of it. I need to see all the bone in that area. I need to see where the defect ends on the facial aspect. Now, in this situation, I went ahead and I placed two dental implants. The type is really irrelevant at this stage, but you can certainly see that we have a significant facial defect in this area. I'm gonna use our golden dent uh, allograft material. Allograft is human bone. It's cortical cancellous, meaning it's both medullary and, and cortical bone uh, in a particular particulate size. Um, I can tell you that golden dent um, material is second to none. And also it's, it's very, very safe to use. It is human bone. I will wet that area to kind of form a gel. And then I'm going to use a membrane. Whenever we use an allograft material, we have to protect that graft from invagination of epithelium. Epithelium grows approximately 10 times faster than bone. And the, the graft material will reintegrate from the apical portion of the site towards the, the uh, crestal portion. So it's a race between bone forming from the apex towards the crest and epithelium growing down into the socket site from the crest towards the apex. Epithelium is going to win. So many of you may have attempted grafting procedures and know the importance of grafting procedures, but um, have gone back and found that the graft really didn't turn over to bone. I can tell you if you follow the correct protocol um, that we teach in our courses, you will grow bone um, nearly 100% of the time. So my membrane is, is cut to size. I'm going to use this membrane now as my new facial wall. I have to place that membrane at least minimally two millimeters beyond the defect. Two millimeters beyond the defect. You want the membrane to lay passively. You can see I'm not holding, tugging, pushing, forcing. I know that membrane is in place and it has become my new facial wall. I'm taking my wetted graft material, my allograft material, and I'm uh, repairing the defect with this allograft material. You can see the different particulate size, and I'm simply placing it around my dental implants. The membrane is then uh, placed through the uh, crestal portion onto the palatal portion, um, again, covering at least minimally two millimeters of palatal bone. Again, you can see that that membrane is passive. It's not gonna go anywhere. Now, we have to suture this into position. How do we do that? Well, I illustrated it a little bit earlier. So let's think about it for a second. If I use a normal, what I'm gonna call normal suturing technique uh, that we probably learned in school, you would go from, you would take the needle, you get it, you're holding it in the widest portion at the, uh, near the, near the um, uh, material itself. Uh, the, the suture material itself, you're holding the needle firmly. Most of you would probably go from facial to palatal. In so doing, you may engage that membrane and in, upon suture removal, or if the patient plays with that suture, you could pull off that membrane. If you pull out that membrane, then the, the graft integration becomes unpredictable. And if I'm going to invest, or the patient's going to invest in a procedure, that's relatively expensive, I want to have predictability. So suturing is probably the most important part of this entire procedure. So how do I do it? You can see my staff is uh, simply taking a, um, a packer, 
a blunted edge uh, instrument and holding it on the crestal gently. And I'm taking my reverse cutting needle and going from the crestal portion to the facial portion. So I'm actually riding on top of the mem membrane. I am not engaging the membrane. I have full control of the situation, which is going to provide me a predictable situation. I'm pulling it through, and then again, I'm simply reversing the needle and going from the crustal portion through the palatal tissue, pulling it through, and then tying my knot. Now you can see here, I do not have complete closure. I don't want complete closure. I'm using a membrane from, from Golden Dent that will last several months. I need my membrane to last at least, at least six weeks. I also, it's imperative that I have a band of attached gingiva, at least a two millimeter band of attached gingiva. So I don't wanna pull that mucosal tissue onto the facial aspect of my surgical site. The area will heal. I, I will remove the sutures in a week and will allow the implants to integrate. And here you can clearly see we have a nice thick band of attached gingiva. We have healthy implant uh, and implant abutments. And here two Bruxer uh, zirconia crowns to create function and form for our patient. Interesting situation. How do we handle uh, a lack of attached gingiva? We have a site that um, we look like we have attached gingiva and we have mucosal tissue. So I like to sit and tell my patients, you know, there's, there's two types of, of, of gum in the mouth. There's the attached gum, the pink gum in between your teeth, and then there's the cheek gum. When teeth are lost, bone will shrink down and in or up and in. And oftentimes that cheek tissue, that movable tissue will follow it and end up on the facial aspect of where we want our implants to be. Many of you may have situations where a patient has an implant and a crown, abutment and crown, and it, it looks fine. You take a radiograph, it looks fine. And yet the patient is feeling something, sensitivity, uh, maybe bleeding, um, brushing their teeth. And it's because there's mucosa on the facial aspect of those implants. We can't have that. So here I'm going to, to make an incision. And um, uh, we have our implant. And um, we're suturing it closed. And two weeks post-op, you can see how fast the tissue will heal. However, three months post-op, it's time for me to uncover the implant. And I still have to have a band, a two millimeter band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. And I really don't. So here I made a mistake. I used what's called a tissue punch. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and uncover the implant so I can make my final impression. Again, this is not an implant training course, but I think many of you understand what I'm talking about. Um, I was gonna take an impression, but uh, oh my gosh, what did I do here? I don't have attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my implant. It's right in mucosa. This is not acceptable in today's environment. So I kind of backtracked a little bit and I took my scalpel and I'm, I'm making my incision on the lingual portion of the crest. I need to create a two millimeter minimal band of attached gingiva. So I'm taking the attached gingiva that was on the lingual portion of the crest, and I'm gonna move it towards the facial uh, portion of our implant. How do I do that? Well, I'm going around the tooth and I'm elevating like my envelope that we talked about. And I can see the implant, I can see the tissue. You can see that the lingual tissue is totally intact. I am not elevating or reflecting that, that lingual tissue whatsoever. In this situation, I'm taking a tall healing abutment. I think most of us would understand what a healing abutment is. It's a tall post or screw that's threaded into the implant that penetrates through the soft tissue. We're getting to where I wanna be here. Now, how do I create attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my dental implant? I'm taking my reverse cutting needle and I'm going from the facial to the palatal aspect, but I am not engaging the lingual tissue. I am not engaging the lingual tissue, which is still attached to the bone. I'm now going around that tall healing abutment. I'm simply looping it around that tall healing abutment. I'm going to turn the needle around 
and I'm going to go from the distal facial aspect of that healing abutment, not engaging the lingual tissue, not engaging the lingual tissue, wrapping it around towards the mesial, and tying my knot. I've now moved tissue that used to be on the lingual aspect of the crest, good attached gingiva, and I moved it to the facial aspect of my healing abutment. You can see where I made an incision with that tissue punch and I kind of traumatized the mucosa. The body heals well. Doctors, how fast does mucosa grow? A half a millimeter a day. We're leaving exposed hard tissue, exposed bone, at least a two millimeter band in that area. I do not cover it. I don't do anything special. It is, this is not a painful procedure for the patient. We're actually, we actually sutured the attached gingiva that was on the lingual aspect of the crest to the healing abutment. I did not engage the lingual uh, attached gingiva whatsoever. Three weeks post-operative doctors, we have a band of attached gingiva where we did not have it before. We now have a healthy situation with, with the suturing technique that is amazing. We're then able to make our final impression, and here we made a nice screw-retained Bruxer final restoration. One more case, and then um, Lauren will take some, some questions if, if you could be so kind. Another situation where we have um, um, uh, an area that we wanna place a couple implants. We want to very carefully look at the mucogingival line. Is there a band of attached gingiva to place dental implants and have healthy tissue, a healthy tissue response? So I took a Sharpie and I just marked it for you. And we can actually tell uh, when we inject, when we infiltrate the mucosal to do an infiltration, we'll see it bubble up and we can see the mucogingival line. So here again, I took that, that very, very nice Orban knife. It gives me a lot of control. You can get this through Golden Dent. And I'm making an, an incision on the lingual aspect of the crest so that I can move that nice, thick, healthy band of attached gingiva. Here it's almost four millimeters to the facial aspect of my implants. I'm making what we call that envelope, not making any vertical incisions, so not engaging or not incising into mucosa, minimizing prostaglandin and histamine release. I now can see my surgical site quite clearly with that envelope flap. Again, we're gonna go ahead and place our implants, uh, going through the procedure, small drill, bigger drill, bigger drill. Our implants are strategically placed. These happen to be Han implants from Glidewell. Um, our implants are placed. Now, if I'm able to achieve at least 25 Newton centimeters of torque, the literature will say that I can put healing abutments. These healing abutments are simply long screws that will penetrate through the soft tissue. I, I want to have a good, healthy band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my implants. So how do I do that, docs? I'm going to, to use my reverse cutting needle through the facial on the mesial. Do not engage the lingual tissue. Loop it around. Turn the needle around. Go from the distal facial. Loop it around again and tie the knot onto the facial aspect. Two sutures will hold this nicely in place. Epithelium will grow half a millimeter a day. That exposed hard tissue will cover over in a very short amount of time. We do not have a lot of discomfort. One week post-op, I like to see my patients. You can see it's a little bit raw, but it's looking good. Four months post-op, we have a band of attached gingiva and a wonderfully healthy epithelial cuff, which will allow me to strategically place my dental implants very, very predictably. In the anterior region, I'm gonna go through this quickly so that we can get to some questions. We have a periodontal defect here. We're going to atraumatically remove a non-restorable tooth using our physics forceps, taking our tooth out, checking with a radiograph, 
I do not have a facial wall. I did not damage it in the extraction. The tooth was infected. You must determine if there's a facial wall. So some of you uh, may be placing anterior implants and not getting the results you want. Taking my Orban knife, making my envelope, elevating that tissue, placing my immediate implant, And you can clearly see that my implant is, is um, stable. However, I do not have a facial plate of, of bone. I'm going to use my membrane that has to extend at least two millimeters beyond the defect. It becomes my new facial wall. I'm taking my golden dent allograft material, wetting it. It creates a gel, placing it. Passively resting that membrane onto the palatal aspect so that it, it's passively placed. And again, using the same surgical technique that I demonstrated earlier to hold that, that membrane in position. And over a period of time, we can restore this tooth with a healthy situation with some semblance of interdental papilla to some degree. Again, extracting a traumatically grafting with our allograft material. Our membrane is passively placed and we can suture the tissue a la the what you feel most comfortable with as we demonstrated with our, our orange and we can uh, move on and hopefully you've learned a few things today um, what i'd like to do is turn it over to kurt with golden dent i know he has some amazing specials and then um uh, lauren if we can answer any questions that people may have had yeah i just turned the uh, screen over to, to kurt so hopefully uh, you can all see the screen now and kurt take it away all right thanks lauren appreciate it uh, i'll try to keep my part here Pretty quick. Uh, my name is Kurt Lawler. I'm with Golden Dent. Um, we're a, a Detroit-based uh, third-generational family dental business. Um, we've uh, had dentistry here in our family for 80-plus uh, years now here in, in the Motor City. Um, so, like I said, we're a Detroit-based dental company that operates under the principles of providing simple, predictable, and unconventional products, um, such as the physics forceps, so the WAM key crown remover, um, and some of the other techniques were demonstrated this evening by, by Dr. Kaczynski. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention the special before I, I show some of the products and some of the new things that um, you may not be familiar with uh, from Golden Dent here in a moment. Um, but we do provide a 15% off uh, promotional code um, where the promotional code for this evening's webinar is uh, NEEDLE15, so it's just N-E-E-D-L-E -E -E and then a 1-5. And that'll allow you a 15% off um, discount on any of the Golden Dent products and our educational programs, which I'll, I'll mention here in a moment. Um, the website is golden-dent. Um, unfortunately, there is a dash there, so please pay attention to that. Um, or if you just type Golden Dent or physicsforceps.com, we will come up also. And uh, our phone number is here also. So I'll get to the uh, products here. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is the, the promotional offer is valid for 24 hours. Um, we do this um, for a couple of reasons. The pricing is uh, it's very good. It's actually even better than our trade show pricing. And we just do kind of a quick uh, special and promotional offer from these webinars uh, for 24 hours. So that'll expire um, tomorrow, uh, August 7th. Um, we get a lot of uh, doctors that join our webinars on a regular basis. I know, um, I could see from the list this evening that uh, doctors have joined our past webinars on extractions and grafting and some of the other webinars by, by Dr. Kaczynski. And so I just wanted to mention, um, even though these weren't discussed this evening, the next couple of products uh, that I'm going to go through on the webinar, um, I just wanted to bring some of these items to your attention. Um, this is our new, uh, we're calling Golden Force. So these are more uh, conventional type uh, extraction instruments, such as like a 150, 151, or an ASH. And um, they're really nice instruments. They have this like a gunmetal type finish on them. Um, they've got great serrations. Um, they're lighter weight based on the holes in the handles. And I just wanted to mention these. Again, it wasn't discussed on the webinar this evening, um, but if anybody hasn't seen these yet, we actually just launched these 
um, last week. And so this is a new product for us if you want to take a look at it. Um, it looks like with a promotional offer, it gets them down to um, around $160 per instrument. The other thing too, which is totally off subject, but again, I wanted to mention it just because, um, again, it's a new product for Golden Dent. Um, since actually last uh, November, we've been doing really well with our uh, sectional matrix system. And the most unique aspect of the system is um, it has a plastic ring. And so a lot of our doctors were, uh, uh, I guess, getting frustrated with rings that, here I can go to the next slide here, that were uh, gross looking, or you weren't sure if you were getting the perfect separation. Uh, maybe your staff accidentally tossed a ring. Um, you really don't have to worry about it with the Wago Trick system because if I go back here to the uh, the uh, system itself, you'll see that the ring, uh, which is green in color, there is actually um, designed to be five to ten times uh, autoclavable. So it's limited use. You use it, um, you get perfect separation. You don't have to worry about um, tracking it, autoclaving it. You can use it one time, or you can use it five to ten times. the uh, The whole sectional matrix system there, which comes with uh, 25 of uh, each of the bands, 25 of each of the wedges, and the instrumentation is only around $200. So it's very uh, competitive. Um, if you're using a different system or maybe the Tuffelmeyer system, this is a good opportunity to um, get into a sectional matrix system. Along with our uh, sectional matrix system, I just wanted to mention our, our Wegofil product. This is actually a zirconium infused composite. Um, we've had a lot of really great feedback on this one too since uh, November of last year. Um, it's 40% zirconia infused. Um, it has a minimal shrinkage, low wear, radio opaque, and then obviously with zirconia, it's going to give you a really great strength for the uh, posterior regions. Um, we kept it simple. We just we just have three shades currently: A1, A2, and B1, and uh, we find that this actually works really well for the uh, the posterior regions. It's something to to take a look at if you're um, maybe not 100% happy with the the composite you're using, or if you wanted to take advantage of the promotional offer and maybe try um, a new composite. We've had a lot of really great feedback on that. In the bottom right corner there, we also have a Wego form. So these are composite instruments. Um, there's a burnisher, different size blades. If that's something that uh, maybe you're looking for uh, updating in your system, uh, they are actually uh, nice uh, instruments that we also didn't make to go along with our composite. So on point here, I guess, is we do have um, various needle holders. So the one that was showed um, this evening that comes with our, our basic graft kit, um, those are also very nice and inexpensive. Those are the ones that are blue. Um, that's more of a conventional type uh, hemostat or, or needle holder. We also have some more uh, unique higher end uh, needle holders if anybody's looking for um, uh, to upgrade their, uh, their needle holders, their hemostats in their office. Um, these aren't going to splay or break or loosen, and, and the biggest benefit is there's really no joints. Um, you see where I have the circle there. There's no joints in the in the instrument that's going to snag the the uh, the suture. So it's a snagless needle holder. Um, these are more durable and lighter than even the titanium instruments on the market, and some of them even have the option to cut and drive the needles with one instrument. So it serves the purpose of a scissor and a uh, and a hemostat in one. You'll see there. There's some uh, a little space where you can slide the suture in there and actually cut it. And then if any of the doctors on the line this evening already have one like this, we're now offering it in a thumb lock. So if you see there over on the right hand side, um, we're actually now offering that instrument in a thumb lock based on some requests from some of the doctors that are using um, these types of instruments. In the bottom right, we, we do have one suture currently. We're not um, a, a company with a bunch of different suture options currently, um, but we do have a black silk. Um, it's inexpensive. I think it's around uh, $17, $18 a box. Um, I know uh, a lot of our doctors are happy with this black silk if you use that. I know Dr. Krasinski um, does not uh, use that type of uh, suture very often, but um, it is one that we do have available. All right, some of our more uh, products that started our company. So the Physics Forceps is available in a standard series and then here in a molar series. This is our more popular instrumentation. I know a lot of doctors that join our webinars maybe already have these or are already uh, Golden Dent customers. Um, but if you're looking for maybe a, a more uh, atraumatic manner of doing extractions, the Physics Forceps have um, now been around actually for 12 years. Um, I know it says 10 on the slide here, but it's actually 12 years since 2007. And we've had a lot of 
uh, really great feedback. We continue uh, to sell a lot of the physics forceps, still very popular for us. And if anybody's looking to, to get into the physics forceps, the standard series is the, the way to start. Um, there's three upper instruments and one lower instrument. The molar series that I show here is more of an accessory or in addition to the standard series. This is really only for erupted third molars um, and, and hard to reach second molars. Um, as with the standard series, you always have a 90 day trial period on the physics forceps. Um, so if you're uh, been thinking about the physics forceps or been looking at it for a number of years, you're not sure, um, just remember you're never stuck with them if you're not happy for any reason. Uh, Dr. Krasinski did show some of these instruments um, uh, on the webinar this evening where if you wanted to use uh, an instrument prior to the physics forceps, um, you don't have to um, because the physics forceps really is an elevator. Um, but this is a, a newer instrument for us called the wedge, um, which is a perfect pre-step uh, prior to the physics forceps. It allows you to gently push uh, apically and wedge between the, uh, the, uh, the two surface and the bone to start the atraumatic extraction process. Um, that can just make the extraction a little bit easier with the physics forceps. Osteogen plugs, um, very, very popular product for us. If you're not using this product now, I highly recommend taking a look at it for the current users that are using the product. Um, I encourage you to use the promotional um, offer and you can stock up on the product that you're already using. Um, but a great product, you can learn a lot more about it online. Um, but basically, if, if, if you can place a collagen plug, um, yeah, this is a great way to get involved in grafting. It's as simple as placing a collagen plug, uh, cross-suturing in place, as was demonstrated by Dr. Krasinski this evening, and uh, you will uh, predictably uh, have, have good bone for, um, for future treatment. So Allograph, this is our uh, Allograph line, which is Goldoss. If you're currently using another brand, um, we, we'd love for you to, to become an Allograph customer of Golden Dent. Um, it is a high-quality bone. Um, there's a lot of allograft in the market, but uh, we believe this is a, a really clinically excellent uh, allograft, and, and we offer it at a fair price. So you can see it's about, uh, it looks like about $45 when you do the buy five, get one, and do the 50% off promotion uh, this evening, which is a pretty fair price for allograft. Uh, so we have it in a particulate and then also in a DBM uh, putty. EpiGuide, uh, the one on the left here, this is um, one that Dr. Kaczynski has used for a number of years. This is a long lasting resorbable membrane. I um, highly recommend taking a look at that. Uh, we actually got away from even teaching uh, non-resorbable membranes because this one stays in place for so long that we find that, um, you know, generally for most cases, you can just use one membrane in your office, which is um, very convenient. It's a large sheet, so remember that it's 18 by 20 in size. Uh, so when you're looking at the pricing, a lot of times doctors do uh, cut the membrane and use it as two different pieces. Um, lastly, I just want to mention this real quick. Um, I, I know there, there's actually a shortage, I believe, in the, the industry right now for gel foam. Um, we've, we've had a lot of uh, great feedback on BioViva. Um, sales have actually been uh, very good uh, in the last month or two for this product um, because of the uh, gel foam shortage. Uh, and then we also have a lot of customers that stick with it, even if gel foam is available. Um, it's a great product that uh, controls bleeding. Um, it's a great alternative to gel foam. I think it's around $60 a box of, of 20 uh, these little gauze packets that you can pop out of the back of the uh, blister pack. Um, but again, very popular product. I just wanted to mention it. Um, wasn't shown this evening, but I uh, just want to kind of do everybody a service. This is a great product to take a look at. Um, I'll just kind of, I'm moving along here. So Amplify. So this is our uh, last thing I'll mention before we get to the questions. This is our hands-on live patient program. So if you want to learn um, extractions and grafting, suturing uh, on live patients, um, this is a great uh, way to, to get involved. We do the courses at UAD here in Detroit. Uh, they're all live patient programs. Uh, we see anywhere from 65 to 100 plus patients, just depending on how many doctors are at the program. Um, and you do the procedures. So this is a, a photo of the facility here at, at UAD. And uh, you work in your own operatory with a partner. And it's, a, it, like I said, it's live patient based. Um, great way to, to learn some of the techniques we discussed this evening. Um, day one is usually like a didactic uh, lecture format, uh, hands-on, going over models, uh, practicing the techniques that you do on uh, live patients the next day. Looks like the next courses coming up are, uh, geez, I guess next weekend already, August 16th and 17th. Looks like we have two seats open for that one. That's our extraction and grafting two-day program. 
And then in uh, September, we have uh, September 21st is our next uh, one day extraction course at UAD. So if you're interested, you can go to Amplify Dental and take a look at those. And I will wrap it up and leave it uh, to Lauren to go into the questions and apologize if I went along there. Uh, again, the promotional code is needle 15, expires tomorrow, and it's 15% off. Thanks, Lauren, appreciate it. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tim, you ready for some questions? Absolutely, Lauren. Okay, we got a few here. I want to try to make sure we get to as many as we can. Um, so, one of the things that um, you had, I don't know how, you know, if you really went into this. So, you, you showed a bunch of different suturing techniques. Is there a specific situation that would dictate one method over another? To, you know, or is it kind of, you know, just whatever they, they're comfortable with? Or how do they decide what suturing technique to use on any given situation? That's, you know, it's a, it's a great question, Lauren. And, you know, I think as dentists, we get into a routine um things that that are easy for us to do i i think um i think practicing the the different techniques and getting proficient at them is is important um number one as we're doing extractions and grafting it's imperative that we not suture the membrane into place so i tried to demonstrate the technique now whether you not use that technique with just a simple interrupted or a mattress it's really irrelevant because it's the needle position that that is is important so that you're on top of the on top of the membrane so um i probably use uh an interrupted and a continuous if i have a long span more than anything else um if i want to get fancy i'll, I'll do a mattress uh, but again i think it's it's just important that you get very very comfortable um, with your suturing technique, because suturing is very, very important um, that the sutures don't come loose. Again, um, go uh, forward uh, two times, forward two times, and once backwards will create a knot that will not come loose with time. So I, I, I don't know how to exactly answer that question other than to say, get proficient at the ones that you, that you like, um, and you'll have great success. Okay. Um, when you've done a, uh, a you know, a, uh, a, a graft, you've got a collagen membrane, you, you've got sutures in place, what type of meds do you normally put them on for pain and for uh, antibiotics? Another great question. So the, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry uh, had a white paper about a year and a half ago that stated that if, there, if there's no sign of infection, there's really no reason for us to use an antibiotic. Okay, so what, what does that mean? If we have an abscess, um, obviously, even if we're curetting and we're cleaning the area, there, there can be some remnant of infection there. Um, and, but I've cut down on my antibiotic regimen um, incredibly. Um, I will give normally uh, 500 milligrams of amoxicillin three times a day for three days. If I can start the day before, I like to do that. But oftentimes patients come in um, uh, without that, without the, uh, possibility of me doing that. So 500 milligrams uh, amoxicillin three times a day for three days. 600 milligrams of ibuprofen is my go-to. Um, 600 milligrams uh, is the standard. Uh, 800 milligrams is no more efficacious than 600, so there's no reason to give an overdose of the ibuprofen. It is rare that I give a narcotic. As long as I'm not incising into mucosa, Lauren, um, we don't have a lot of postoperative discomfort. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. What was the name of the knife that you used? Orban. O-R-B-A-N. And you can get through that through Kurt. Um, he has a really nice uh, set of instruments um, that, they, uh, that they back up very nicely. Orban. O-R-B-A-N. And how do they sharpen it if it gets dull? Um, you know, it, it's, um, I, I, I'm assuming that they can, they can sharpen it. I, I guess I haven't really done that. It's, it's a uh, you know, high-grade stainless steel. Uh, and the design of it, it's like um, almost like a, how can we say it? It's like a, like a spear, you know. Um, and so uh, it's it's something that doesn't really dull uh, like a thin blade would. Okay. Um, so we had a few questions about the the knots, and you know, I'll try to summarize them. You know, some people had learned 
slightly different techniques, you know, two forward, two back, two forward. Some people had learned, you know, uh, you know, two back, uh, two, uh, two forward, two back, single over, single back, for gut. I mean, you know, how do you, is, is there any rhyme or reason to this? Is one no. better for a specific material than others? No, I think I think the, the critical thing is that you're going in different directions, which will which will prevent the knot from loosening. It, it can't loosen in, in both directions, so it doesn't really matter. Two one two 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 one one two two. It doesn't really matter. Okay, um, a little bit of question about um, grafting in some of your previous. Let me see if I can find the question here. In some of your previous webinars, you had talked about. Um, using like an osteogen without a membrane and you know you've talked about allograft with membrane you know is there one that you prefer over the others or is it just kind of depend on the situation well i, I think the, the the you know things change in dentistry a lot and if if i have a a socket with all the walls intact i think using an inexpensive synthetic material has proven to be very 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 effective I've done a lot of histology, Lauren, um, going back and, and, and coring out samples, and it will convert to bone, and it's a very, very inexpensive method. Uh, the literature now will say if you do have a facial wall defect, you are going to want to use a membrane and an allograft material or human bone. Uh, that's, that's all the rage in the literature right now. If you're using an allograft, you must use a membrane, and that membrane must, must stay in place for at least six weeks to make the results predictable. Okay. Um, what about flap tension? You know, especially for people that haven't done this a lot, is there an ideal, you know, rule of thumb for how, how much uh, tension should there be on the flap? Obviously you don't want to rip it, that's not a good thing, but uh, what advice would you get someone who, who may not, you know, have a lot of experience doing suturing on, on that, these types of cases? That, that's probably the best question of the night, Lauren. That, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, what I tried to demonstrate tonight was the importance of, of attached gingiva on the facial aspect. And in the past, um, in, in the past, when we were both young men, we used a uh, non-resorbable material and we had to get complete closure. To, give, to get complete closure, we had to pull, which means that we oftentimes took mucosa from the cheek area and pulled it onto the facial aspect of our surgical site. We don't need to do that anymore. So as you saw, just about every case I showed, the, the, the crustal aspect of the, of the surgical site was exposed. The body will heal. And I think we, we, we can't forget that. You know what, the best analogy I use, Lauren, is uh, if any of you ever had a hangnail, you know how you can be miserable. A hangnail can be the most painful thing in the world, it can ruin vacations, you can't walk, your, your feet hurt. What do you immediately do? You soak your foot, you cut the nail, and within five minutes, you forgot that you even had a problem. The body is an amazing thing. So don't over tense. I, I think that it's important that you control the amount of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of your surgical sites. Remember that epithelium will grow a half a millimeter, even up to a millimeter a day, and the surgical site will heal. Okay. For uh, immediate implant placement, are you typically putting oxygen to fill in the, the space there, since obviously the tooth space is different than uh, an implant? Well, that's not fair. That's not, that's not a suturing question, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, will use, I will use a variety of materials. Again, if I have all the walls intact, I don't have a problem using my calcium appetite, the osteogen plug, uh, placing it and threading the implant directly into that site. Many of you have seen me use that technique. Um, or I can even use an allograft material and do the same thing. Um, but again, if you use an allograft material, and again, it's a whole nother webinar that we'll have to, we'll have to catch up with again in the future. Um, if you have, if you're using an allograft material, um, you, you must protect it with a membrane or, or some type of, of barrier that will prevent invagination of epithelium. The literature will say is if, will say that the, if the gap between the body of the implant and the facial aspect of bone, is more than two millimeters, you must, you must protect it. If it's two millimeters or less, physiologically, the, the epithelium won't grow into that site and you, you will get healing. But you can see, and I really appreciate the question, Lauren, how important suturing is. It's a very, very critical um, art that will, can make or break a case very easily. 
And, and if we're able to suture correctly and we're able to maintain the surgical site, we will get predictability. And that's all I ask for. When I do a procedure, I want to know that it's going to work. I don't want to hope that it's going to work. Okay. So you, you do an allograft. You do, uh, you know, you've got your membrane in there. Patient calls about four or five days later. The sutures pop and they can feel this grainy stuff in their mouth. What do you do? Well, um, hopefully that doesn't happen because that really shouldn't <laughs> happen if you follow the procedure. If, 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 if the graft is exposed to the oral environment, the case becomes unpredictable. I didn't say it won't work. I just don't know if it's not going to work. So, you know, you have two options. You can hope and pray, um, put holy water, water on it and hope that it works out um, or to take everything apart and start over. So that's why, you know, again, it's so imperative that we, we do these procedures correctly from the very beginning. Great question, though. Yeah. Okay. What, what about concerns about needle sticks? I mean, obviously, you got a lot more needles to deal with when you got sutures versus just giving injections. You know, do, is it a concern for you and your assistant during surgery and procedures? Not, not really. You know, it's all about control. You know, again, using a reverse cutting needle, you really do have control. Um, no, I, I don't think that is a concern. Okay. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour, and even though we, I said we wouldn't get to all the questions, I do want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's time. So, uh, Tim, you know, as I, and I've, I've said this on a few webinars in the past, uh, you and I have probably done, you know, average at least four or five a year. Every time I learn something new, you're not one of those presenters who just regurgitates their slides over and over again. It's always new stuff, new information, um, just fantastic info. And, and I want to thank you and uh, let you, you know, any closing comments you'd like to make, um, and then we'll call it a night. Well, I, I appreciate you, your, your professionalism. You're, you're, you're awesome. Um, you're an awesome host, and I appreciate that. But, and again, you know, we want to share all this information. So if, um, if, if I went too fast and you want to see this, I, I think um, – contacting Kurt at Golden Dent. I'm, I'm sure he'd be willing to share a lot of this information and hopefully to see uh, many of those people we had, gosh, so many people watching today, uh, come to some of the courses and really do it hands-on on live patients. That's where you really learn. Yep, agreed. Well, speaking of Kurt, uh, thanks to him and Golden Dent for the, spon for the sponsorship. Uh, most of you, you know, who have done webinars in the past know how much time and energy goes into creating the content and getting the invitation sent out and organizing everything. Uh, I'm very appreciative of, of their efforts to make sure that all this great content gets out to people. Uh, I don't believe they've ever charged for it. I don't think they ever will charge for it. Uh, I think it's, it's considerably more valuable than uh, what people pay. Um, I would certainly encourage you to take advantage of the specials. Uh, when Kurt says that this expires tomorrow, that means make sure you call before 11.59 p.m. because if you wait to Thursday, it's not going to be there. Uh, and I think it's a very generous offer, the 15%. Uh, but please take advantage of that. Try to, as, as uh, Dr. Kaczynski recommended, uh, if you can possibly sign up for some of the continuing education opportunities, I think it's a great way to really uh, learn all of this stuff, extractions, grafting, suturing. Uh, you really cover all the bases. We do these webinars on a regular basis, as I said. Uh, we're going to try to get Tim back as soon as we possibly can. Um, and to remind everyone, uh, two things. Number one, we did record this webinar. Uh, Golden Dent will send out the recording. Usually it's within 24 hours or so. Give them a day or two just in case you don't see it right away. Um, we are, uh, they are offering con continuing education credits for people that were on the webinar live. Uh, because of the number of people on, it could take a few weeks before you see those credits. But please be patient. Uh, they do go through the list and make sure you know people that were only on for a minute uh, don't get credit, and those that were here for the majority of it do get their credits. So we thank all of you for joining us this evening. We know your time is valuable, and we look forward to seeing all of you on future webinars. Good night, everyone. <laughs>